Alright guys, so tonight we're going to be talking about croup and epiglottitis like Tyler and Steve have been talking about. Um, I named the presentation The Seal in the Field. Uh, you'll learn about it in a little bit more on croup. So, we're going to do a little scenario here. You're going to be disp dispatched out for a three-year-old male with a recent history of fever, noisy breathing, and difficulty breathing. So just from those three things, what are some ideas that you guys would be thinking about right now? What could be wrong with this kid? Just start throwing them, out, throwing them out at me. Some kind of infectious process. Yeah, it could be some type of infection. Croup? Yeah, it could be croup. Pneumonia. Could be pneumonia. Could be a whole list of things. It can just go on and on and on. So now you get this nice set of vitals here. Respiration's 30, even and shallow. Blood pressure is 106 over 72. SpO2 is 89% on room air. Pulse is 150. Awake and alert, and in tripod position. So out of these six things, what do you guys pick out as being some problems here? Tripod. Tripod position, that's a big one. Tripod position, they're leaning forward, they're kind of bracing themselves. Uh, they're really working to breathe if they're in tripod position. It kind of assists the airway and it's not a good sign to see, especially in kids. What else is bad up here? SpO2. SpO2 of 89%. You never want a kid to have an SpO2 of 89%. The shallow respiration? Yes, shallow respirations. A kid shouldn't be that shallow. The rate is a little bit fast, not too bad for a kid, but being shallow is not that great. Uh, the pulse is also a little bit fast. Now, the kid decides to start coughing on you, and it's a barking sea-like cough. At that point, what do you guys think it is? Croup. Croup. There you go. That's the reason why I named it the seal in the field. Mm. So what croup is, it is a viral upper respiratory infection, uh, most commonly attributed to the parainfluenza virus, but not limited to it. There are a couple other viruses that can cause it. Uh, typically lasts about three to five days. It has a very slow onset period. It comes on kind of like a cold. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it just kind of keeps getting worse. It targets six-month-olds to three-year-olds most commonly. That's not uh, set in stone. It can only affect this age group, but that's the most common group that you see croup in. If you look right here, it's an x-ray. You can see, we talked about it earlier, it's called steeple sign, where you can see the airway narrows right there and it gets real shallow. So if it gets that shallow, not much air is going to be moving into the lungs, right? So right here, this is the physiology of why you get that seal-like bark. Um, in a real young kid, their, their trachea, their airway is, say, just for instance, four millimeters. Where in an adult, it could be eight millimeters. It's half the size, right? So you get one millimeter of edema in both the kid and the adult. Well, in the kid, that's a 75% decrease of usable airway space. It gets real tiny that they're trying to move air through in there. Whereas an adult, you still got plenty of room, it's only a 44% decrease. What this is saying is it's an inverse relation between the radius of the airways and the resistance of the air. So as the airway gets smaller, the resistance goes up. It's like trying to blow air through a coffee straw, right? It doesn't work very well. That's why it works so well for uh, vagal maneuvers. The so some sounds that you can hear along with that, if you're listening to the lung sounds like Steve was just talking about, is strider. You can hear an inspiratory strider if it's at the glottic opening or above the glottis. You can hear biphasic strider if it's, at, uh, if it's below the glottis or in the trachea. You can also hear biphasic strider if it's all over, if it's happening in multiple places. And then expiratory strider, not as common, it's an obstruction at the level of the alveoli. And typically it's not really referred to as a strider because it's more of a wheeze. Your strider really doesn't happen down low. Croup is a compounding problem. Uh, like I said earlier, it starts out as a typical cold for this kid. You might think he just has the sniffles. Not that big of a deal. But then at night you hear him start coughing a little bit more. The symptoms of croup tend to get worse at night. And this coughing then leads to more irritation. They have a sore throat, which means the, which, which leads the more coughing, they start to get anxious. They start to get worked up. They can't get air in. They become worried. And it just kind of keeps getting worse and worse and worse and building. And the more anxiety they get, the more coughing they get, the more that airway swells and gets smaller. Um, very rarely does it cause se severe to complete obstruction. Um, it's not every day that you get a croup uh, where it just swells all the way shut and the kid can't breathe at all. 
but it can be scary for them, and if it get left untreated, it can get pretty bad. There we go. Uh, there are some other symptoms. So respiratory distress. What do you guys think respiratory distress looks like? What do you guys classify as respiratory distress? I want to just hear your guys' ideas. Accessory muscles. Accessory muscles. Yep, accessory muscles. If you see that. Yep, subclavian retract. Uh, subclavian retractions, intercostal retractions, stuff like that. Tripod position is a sign of respiratory distress. Cyanosis can be a sign of respiratory distress. All that different stuff. You're also going to see them. They're going to be very hoarse when they talk. It's going to be very scratchy. It's just. It's not a pleasant sound. And so, it's due from all that inflammation in there, it just, they don't sound right. Nasal congestion or runny nose. The reason that happens is because uh, croup actually starts in the upper airway, really up high. It starts in the nasal pharynx. That's typically where they go to daycare, they come in contact with another kid who coughs right in their face, they breathe in through their nose, gets infected up there, and it actually goes downwards. Gravity assists it. So it starts up high and it slowly goes down until it works its way into the glottic opening and into the trachea. Uh, fatigue, it is an illness. Your body, it taxes on your body. It uses its resources. So they're going to get tired. They're going to become fatigued. Um, they're also going to become agitated. They, they've never had this feeling of not being able to breathe before. So it causes agitation. They get kind of worked up. Drooling isn't as common in croup, but it is possible. It's a very low amount. Uh, phlegm, it's, it's an infection that's going to cause phlegm. It's your body's natural way to fight things. And a sore throat. Some people also call it crowing sounds. That's right. So what are some questions that you guys might ask to either the, the parent or the child that you're responding to this call? What are some ideas that you want to start building for your differential diagnosis? Is anyone else in the house sick? Yep. Is anybody else in the house, the house sick? Maybe the mom had a cold last week and gave it to the kid. Just the onset time would be important too. Yep, the onset time. Any others? Do they have a history of this? Yep, do they have a history of croup? Has your child, has your child had croup in the past? Um, also, is your child fully vaccinated? Has your child's cough become progressively worse? If so, how rapidly? Um, croup is a slow onset, like I said. It's not going to, boom, there's respiratory distress right there. If that happens, croup probably isn't going to be the culprit. Um, and has your child recently been exposed to other sick children? Did they go to a daycare? Did the daycare have an outbreak? Um, are they school age where they're exposed to a lot of different microbes throughout the day? Upper bronchitis. So the reason I call this upper bronchitis is one day I got a call and I was out in Slinger. Uh, our dispatchers told me that we were going to Hartford Hospital for a transfer down to Children's for upper bronchitis. Yeah, Larry was on this call with me. me. Yeah. Um, and as we're going, him and I are just spitballing. We're like, what the hell could they mean by upper bronchitis? We get there, and this nurse goes, so you have this, I don't know, three-year-old, five-year-old, something, with epiglottitis. You can kind of see where we're playing telephone with the dispatcher. You can make a little mistake. But it, it made a lot more sense then. So what epiglott epiglottitis is, is an inflammation infection of the epiglottis. If you look right here, this is your pretty looking epiglottis. You got your epiglottis right there. You got your glottic opening. You can see your vocal cords in there. That's what you want your airway to look at if you go in and look at somebody's airway. To the right, you can see it's real swollen, right? It's not pretty looking. If this wasn't here, you would notice that that area is a lot smaller. Air is not going to be able to get through there as easily as in through there. So that's it starts to present a problem. The reason that epiglottitis is such a big deal in little kids is because of the physiology of them. Their epiglottitis is more cephalid, which means more anterior and towards the head. And it's also elongated and more flexible. It's more floppy, so it can get in the way more. And it's longer because just in relation to the rest of the airway structures. Um, so this poses a problem. If it starts to become inflamed, it'll get in the way. The three Ds of epiglottitis is drooling, dysphagia, and distress. Um, they have a sore throat, they have dysphagia. What is dysphagia? Difficulty yes, difficulty swallowing. So if they have a difficulty swallowing, they can't swallow that saliva, so they drool it out. And then distress, respiratory distress. If you see these three, uh, three things together, it's kind of an ominous sign that this kid might have epiglottitis and it's not something that you want to mess with.
So what is epiglottitis exactly? Most typically it's a bacterial infection caused by hemophilus influenzae type B, HIV. Um, the sore throat is the most common symptom. 94% of people present with a sore throat. The gold standard to diagnose epiglottitis nowadays is using a nasal fiber optic laryngoscopy. So they stick a camera down your nose to look at your epiglottis and just visualize it. If it looks like that, you have epiglottitis. If it doesn't, it's probably something else. So in the past, it was a 2.6 to 1 ratio of children to adults. So over double the amount of kids rather than adults were getting epiglottitis. Nowadays, it's a 0 0.3 to 1 ratio. So there's only 0.3 kids to every adult that gets epiglottitis. Why do you think that is? Vaccinations. Vaccinations, yep. They come, came up with the HIV vac vaccine. So kids nowadays are not getting epiglottitis as much. So you're seeing it more in adults. Adult cases are typically more subacute. They come on slower rather than in a child. It's kind of a bing, bang, boom. It's not good. The adults slowly gets up and the structures in adults are different. It doesn't affect them as bad. So this right here is just an x-ray. You can see their epiglottis right here is really swollen out. Uh, as Tyler said earlier on in the day, it's called thumb sign because it kind of looks like a thumb. But as you can see, it's blocking off their airway. They're not going to get air in there as easily. So signs and symptoms of epiglottitis, uh, most of the time they're going to have an upper respiratory infection along with it. Um, they're going to have an acute fever. It's going to be a pretty high fever, and it's going to come on real fast. They're going to have sore throat. They're also going to have hoarseness, so they're going to have a scratchy voice. Um, a lot of times they're going to be in this tripod sniffing high hybrid position. Um, children do this because when they do it, the epiglottis kind of moves out of the way. It just anatomically opens up their airway better for them. So you'll see that in kids with epiglottitis. It's not a good sign, but it is helping them. So keep them in this position if it's making their breathing easier. Um, they're going to be very restless, anxious. They've never experienced this feeling of not being able to breathe. Um, so they're just going to be restless. And typically they're going to be mouth breathing. The reason behind that is because your mouth is bigger than your nose. They can get air in faster, so they're going to do that. It's probably better for them to be able to breathe in through your nose because then it's going to be a little bit more humidified, but unfortunately, they want more air in, so they're breathing through their mouths. So here's just a quick, simple chart um, comparing epiglottitis and croup. Epiglottitis is caused by H. influenzae compared to croup being caused by parainfluenza virus. Uh, the age is a little different, but both young kids the onset of epiglottitis is rapid compared to croup being very gradual. Um, the site, obviously, epiglottitis is above the glottis, because it's the epiglottis. Um, and you're going to have a hair, very high fever in epiglottitis. So what do I do now? What do you guys have some, how are you guys going to treat this patient? Some ideas. Which one, happy or the... We'll go with epiglottitis. So you have a patient with epiglottitis, how are you going to treat them? Uh, put three milliliters of one to one thousand epi in a neb and run it. Yep, we got nebulized epi as one of our treatments. Mm -hmm. What's what's the biggest one? Don't anger them. That's it. Keep the patient calm. The more agitated they get, the more coughing they get, the more it's going to become irritated. The worse the symptoms are going to get. And like I said, it's just going to keep compounding. So keep the patient calm, both in croup and epiglottitis. Position of comfort. Yes, position of comfort, really anything to keep them calm. Um, humidified oxygen. So if you guys start looking at your protocols in front of you, for some reason, you have to be an intermediate uh, to be able to do a saline neb. I don't know why. Um, if you're lucky enough, maybe you have an ambulance where you have a humidifier that you can set that up and give it to them that way. Not all the ambulances have them. But humidified oxygen really helps. Um, yes. mm -hmm. I know 5-4 steals them a lot from hospitals, so they typically have them. 5 normally has them. Uh, albuterol, if there's wheezing present, um, it's not necessarily a first line or anything with epiglottitis and croup, but it is in there. If you hear wheezing, it'll open it up, make it a little easier for them to breathe. And then, like Matt said, nebulized epi. 
what not to do with these patients. Do not try and visualize the airway. You don't want to cause any more trauma, especially if it is epiglottitis. If you start poking around in there with a laryngoscope, you're going to irritate it and that thing can slam shut and then the kid's not going to get any air in at all. So don't attempt to visualize it. Avoid superglottic airways. If the kid manages to be big enough that you think you can fit a king into them or a combi tube, don't do it because the way that they're designed when they go in, if the uh, epiglottis is inflamed, it can actually push it against it and shut off the airway completely. And then you're not doing anything but making things worse. Uh, intubation, and this is very com controversial, so I kind of want to let you guys talk about this for a little bit. Um, in some places that I, when I was doing my researches, research, some pa places actually completely contraindicate intubation in epiglottitis. Um, we do have it in our protocols, but it's a very last ditch effort. Um, so what do you guys think about this? Do you guys, you're only going to get one shot if you go for an intubation. Anybody have any thoughts, comments on it? The sun's shut, you're done. Yeah. You're criking. Yeah, it's it's a last ditch effort, and if it doesn't work, you're going to be criking, which sucks just as bad as little kids, because I don't know if you guys have ever felt the structures on the little kid. They're just not there. They're hard to find. It's not pretty. So what counts as, a, as a, an attempt when you're intubating? So you stick the blade in the... As soon as that blade goes past the peak, that's considered one attempt. Mm -hmm. there. So, and you only have one attempt at this. It says uh, we don't want an RSA. So it's going to be pretty hard. <laughs> not only does this kid have a tight airway, but you're not using any paralytics or uh, you know really anything to facilitate this intubation. Mm -hmm. So, if, I guess they're saying if you're getting to this point, the kid's probably unresponsive. Yeah. And at that point, what do you think would probably be one of the better things to do? Bag them. And if you can't bag them. So um, if you can't intubate this kid, I mean, you can go in and look and say, yeah, it's tight, but um, a crike might be one of your options that you have to think about. And so you think about our vortex that we look at with emergency airway. We start off on the perimeter with bag valve mask, and then we pick one, you know, either intubation, some sort of superglottic airway, or, a, um, or just the BVM. And quickly, if one of those things don't work, we spiral down the middle to doing the crike. So that's something you got to think about that might be an option here is doing the crack. The other thing is, uh, what do you notice about giving uh, giving the nebulized epi the difference between croup and epiglottitis? When do you give it for somebody with croup if they're stable or unstable? Unstable. Unstable, right? What about epiglottitis? Do you tell them if they're stable? And if they're unstable, that's where you're looking at intubation or obtaining some sort of airway. You really hope you never get to the unstable point in epiglottitis, so that's why you do the nebulized epi right off the bat to try and stop that real early on so that you can get to the hospital and let them deal with it. Um, when I was doing the research about hospitals, um, they're not going to intubate this kid in the ER. They're only going to do this. They're going to bring him to the OR and they're going to have every second option available there. They're going to have a tray kit there. They're going to have something if they need to whatever they need to do, they're going to have all the backup plans, because if this one, two attempt that they get doesn't work, they got to have a backup plan. What are you going to say? How much time do we have? I mean, I'm transporting my child, goes unresponsive, no airway, I'm checking, I have nothing, and how much time do I have to try to Well, how long can you wait for us? Like, for a child, yeah. I mean, three minutes? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't withhold it. I would do it right away. Well, yeah, I so said if you're holding your breath, you know, so you got, yeah. you got seconds to make that decision. Unless it happens to happen literally in the bay or something, I would I would do it. Yeah, everybody's going to be your top priority here. So, you know, um, you go in, you look, yeah, it's tight, I can't see anything, there's so much edema, or, you know, the kid's got so much drool and trying to suck. Don't waste your time trying to get, because the chances are you're probably just going to be really tight, and you're probably not going to see much. You, at that point, you need to marry yourself to so get some sort of airway. Are kids, are they too big for a three-year-old? We have a pediatric. Mm -hmm. If you go on the small, put it on the seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 
Have her like I do with the, the, the pregnancy around, so or the delivery kit. <laughs> so normally the adult one is going to be in your green bag and your pediatric one is going to be up in your patch. That's how the movie people have all set up. Okay. And how do you train it? How do you pick your tube size for a kid? Let's say we got a three-year-old. Not looking at the protocol. You guys um, normal tube size would be the age of the kid by, by four plus four. Excellent. Exactly. So a three-year-old mm -hmm. by four, so point seven five. Call it one plus four. Use a size five, four and a half to a five. That's right. Um, this kid would be glad to get a two and a half or a three. Yeah. So cut it in half. Exactly. And so that yeah. that yeah. plus four changes to plus 3.5 if you're using a cuff tube. Who thinks you probably don't need a cuff tube on, on this kid? Yeah. No. And so what do they normally tell you when you're going to intubate? Uh, grab a size lower and a size higher before you intubate because you need it. I would grab a size lower and then a size lower. <laughs> that way you have that ready in case. But you you're only going to try one. Right. But I mean, you have to learn to scope in there. That counts as one, right? right. So if I go in there and I go, ooh, that's, that's too small, this hand <laughs> this is my one attempt, so yeah. Just don't take the learning. Got all three or four of them. Yeah. So uh, back to the nebulized epi part of it. To do this, it's three milligrams and three uh, milliliters, and then you just put it right into the neb mask. You set it at about six to eight liters per minute. We were talking about this earlier on how the reason that we do six to eight liters per minute is it changes the molecule size of what you're nebulizing. If you put it up to the 15 liters per minute, it makes them really tiny, and then what happens is they get farther down into the airway. Epiglottitis and croup isn't a lower airway problem, so you don't want it getting that far. You want to keep it high. So we put it at the 6 to 8, and it typically ends up in the trachea to uh, epiglottis region. Um, and then you want to put them in a sniffing position. It opens everything up a little bit better. It'll make them breathe easier. Um, we carry right now both kinds of epi 1 to 1000. We have the ampules and the multi dose vial. So if you only have these, you can't find that. You need three of them. Break them all open, draw them out, and then squirt them into your net mask. Um, typically, typically you're going to be doing a mask. If they can tolerate it on their face, do that. Otherwise, if you just hold it in front of them and do like a blow by option, whatever keeps the kid calm and allows them to get that nebulized epi in, that's what you want to do. No, wait, AJ, this kid's heart rate is 160. I don't want to give him epi, right? That might increase his heart rate. Uh, if he's not breathing, he's dead. I was gonna say. Yeah. Airway is the main problem, and he's probably ticking along so fast because he's going hypoxic. He's worked up. If you can open that up, get air in there, hopefully it'll calm him down, and then the heart rate won't be as much of an issue. So, right here, I just threw some more pictures up there. This one I thought was crazy. You can really see how bad that epiglottis can get. It literally looks like there's a cherry in that kid's airway. So if it gets that bad, there's not any air moving in there, right? Um, here's just another picture. It's not as bad, but it's still pretty inflamed. Another x-ray picture of it. Over there is another steeple sign in croup where you can see how thin it gets. Um, this is just an animated picture of croup. And then a cute little baby who's coughing. So do you guys have any questions on epiglottitis, croup? nebulized epi, anything. You know, I wonder what makes certain viruses or bacteria settle in certain areas. You know what I mean? Like, why does it pick Yeah, pick it's, it's the most hospitable environment for them. That makes sense. Like, humid, warm. And yeah. And if you think about it, epiglottis is it's kind of a little area in there that when stuff drips down, it can get stuck there for a little bit and um, being stagnant is what really causes infection. Same with pneumonia. That's why grandma's sitting like this. She's going to get pneumonia right here. It's not going to be up here. That's 